Let's pray, and we're going to get right into the message this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time in your presence. God, thank you for the beautiful way that you enter into your people when they declare your praises and just seek your heart. We now come to a time, Lord, where we want to sit at your feet. And we want you to teach us. And so God, give us ears to hear and minds to conceive and hearts to receive the word that you have for us today. So as we go forth from this place, we would go forth as not just hearers, but doers of your word. And all your people said, Amen. Last week and this week, uh, we've been going back to the basics on prayer. And our little framework that we're using to do that is actually provided for us by uh, Rudyard Kipling. Kipling, a long time ago, wrote these words. He said, I have six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what, why, when, how, where, and who. And last week, we looked at the serving man, what. We started right there with what. What is prayer? What is prayer? And we discovered at the heart and core, true prayer is heart-to-heart communication with God. Say that with me. True prayer is heart-to-heart communication with God. And then we looked at who should pray. Who should pray. And we discovered that there are at least two different types of people that should pray. First, anyone and everyone who wants a life that's whole and satisfying, complete, connected to God, and connected to the life that He's dreamed for us. And secondly, anyone and everyone who wants to make a difference for God in this world and for all eternity. Those are the kind of people that should pray. Today, the first of Kipling's serving men that I want to invite to serve us is a serving man, why? Why pray? Friends of George Mueller of Bristol, England, were here this morning. He would boldly answer that question, why pray? George was born in Germany, or what used to, well, at that time it wasn't actually Germany, but has become Germany in 1805. In 1832, he felt God leading him to become a pastor in Bristol, England, and It wasn't long after he arrived that he discovered that the real reason God had actually brought him to Bristol, England wasn't to be a preacher, but it was kids. Kids. You see, George Mueller loved kids, but it was more than that. In that day, if you were a kid and you didn't have a family, if you didn't have a family, you were either on the streets or you were in jail. Those were your two options. Through the years as George watched these kids being abused and mistreated. He came to the point where his heart just broke. And he knew that God was calling him to do something about it. And so in 1835, he stepped out in faith and he opened up his very first orphanage that housed 30 kids. But it wasn't long after that that things began to explode. And before he knew it, he had five houses, complete staff for each house, and over 20, hear this, 2,100 kids depending on him for a roof over their head, foods in their belly, and clothes on their backs. And hear this, he did this without any government assistance whatsoever. None. Amazingly, not once, hear this, not once in over 21 years did George Mueller or any of his staff ever tell a human being about their financial or material needs. Not once. Why? Because George Mueller was convinced that if you needed something, you didn't go to the servant. You went to the master. You went to the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, not the one who walks over those cattle on a thousand hills. And so he committed himself and he made his staff pledge to never tell another human being about their financial or their material needs. If there was a need, they were to go directly to God in prayer. Well, as you can imagine, think about this. You're feeding 2,100 mouths. You're paying staff. You're keeping the roof over the heads of that many people. There were a great many needs. But hear this. God always provided. Always provided. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, used to say that when you do the Lord's work in the Lord's way, in the Lord's timing, you'll have the Lord's provision. The Lord always provided. Let me give you just a couple examples. 
In his personal journal, George Mooley records one morning when the tables were all set for breakfast, but the cupboard, like the proverbial Mother Hubbard cupboard, was bare. And there was absolutely no cash in a box. No cash in a box. No food, no cash. The children are standing. They're waiting for their breakfast. And Mr. Mueller says, children, you know we must be on time for school. And then lifting his head, he prayed very simply, Dear Father, thank thee for what thou art going to give us to eat. They had no food at the moment. He prays, thank thee for what thou art going to give us to eat. And at that very moment, there was a knock at the door. It was a local baker. And when he opened the door, this local baker said, Mr. Mueller, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt like you needed bread for breakfast. And the Lord told me to give you some. And so I got up at 2 o'clock this morning, and I baked you some fresh bread, and here it is. With that, Mr. Mueller thanked the baker, and of course he praised God for his care. And then a little while later, while the children were actually sitting down and eating their bread, there was a second knock at the door. This time, it was a milkman <laughs> whose cart just happened to break out down right outside of the orphanage. <laughs> just happened to break down there. And he had come up to the orphanage to unload his milk onto the orphans so that he could get his wagon repaired. Friends, if George Mueller were here today, he would boldly respond to the question, why pray, by saying, because God loves to give good gifts to those who ask. Why pray? Because God loves to give good gifts to those who ask. Over 50 times between 1849 and 1870, George Mueller and his orphanages were penniless. Absolutely penniless. But they prayed, and God provided. God provided. There's a second way that I believe that George Mueller and others that know God would answer the question, why pray? And it's this. Because there is power in prayer. There is power in prayer. In Mark chapter 9, in verses 15 through 29, there's a very interesting story about the power of prayer. Its lessons are actually taught throughout the New Testament, but I want to focus on this one section. Mark chapter 9, verses 15 through 29. It says, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and they ran to greet him. Speaking to his disciples, he said, what are you arguing about with them? A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. Foam, he foams at the mouth, gash, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I ask your disciples to drive out the Spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving Spirit, you, excuse me, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And so they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fed to the, fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It is often throwing him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me in my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you to come out of him and never again enter him. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he was dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, and here's the key, this kind can only come out by prayer. By prayer. 
Friends, I want us to notice something here. I want us to notice something that most people do not notice. Hear this. Jesus did not say to the disciples, sorry guys, you know what? You couldn't do what I just did because I'm God and you're not. No. Jesus does not attribute his power in this situation to his divine attributes or his divine nature. No, instead he says, the power is in prayer. The power is in prayer. And so, friends, what does that mean for you and me? It means that if you and I want to see God's power released in our lives, if we want to see God's power released in our sphere of influence where we live, work, study, and play, then we better learn how to pray because there is power in prayer. Matthew 17 actually records the very same story, but at the end of the story, Jesus actually adds a word, one single word. He says God's power is released through prayer and fasting fasting and so friends what's fasting fasting is simply a period of time where you and i abstain from food or some other thing why to focus on prayer to focus on prayer and so jesus is teaching his disciples of that day and his disciples of this day that there are certain things that can only be accomplished through focused prayer no other way but through focused prayer And so, friends, if you and I want to see God's power manifested in our lives, if we want to see God's power manifested in our sphere of influence where we live, work, study, and play, then we've got to learn to pray. We've got to learn to pray. And so how do we actually do that? How do you learn to pray? Well, the truth is you learn to pray in all kinds of different ways. We learn to pray by reading books, by by hearing messages, by watching others pray, by studying the lives of great Christians who gave their life to prayer. But hear this, primarily, you and I learn to pray by studying the Bible, God's instruction manual for human living, and by praying, by praying. Years ago, my favorite second daughter, Heather, wanted to learn how to ride a bike. And to be honest, there really wasn't much room in our little neighborhood or on our street for her to practice. And so when she wanted to practice, I'd pack up Heather and pack up the bike and usually pack up one or two of the other girls. And we all go down to the church parking lot. And of course, at first, Heather didn't know how to ride. And so I always threw on some running shorts and some shoes and, and I'd get behind her and I'd hold on to her seat. And if she began to fall, I would catch her and I'd straighten her up. And you know what? Hear this. The more we did that together, the more she learned. And the more she learned, the bolder she became. Learning to ride a bike is very similar to learning how to pray. At first, the truth is you're going to feel awkward and uncomfortable and unbalanced and not quite sure of yourself. The only real comfort is that you know that God is behind you all the way and he's got his hand on you. And as you allow God's hand to guide you and you learn to balance your experience with God's word, the Bible, then you're going to find yourself growing bolder in your prayers. I promise you. Absolutely. That will happen. Learning to pray comes as you and I learn to balance our experience with God's word. Now, let me give you a little homework that I think most of you are going to enjoy if you want to learn how to pray. I want to invite you to actually sit down at the feet of Jesus this coming week. And at the feet of Jesus, I want to invite you um, to learn from him. I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter, uh, excuse me, turn to, to the book of Luke. And I want to invite you to do a little study there on the life of Jesus in prayer. Luke actually records nine different occasions, nine different occasions where Jesus prays. Why? So you and I can learn from him. So I want to encourage you to write these down and look them up later. All right, write these down and look them up later. They're all out of the book of Luke. Luke 321, 5, 16, 6, 12, 9, 18, 9, 29, 11, 1, 22, 32. So chapter 22, verse 22 verses 40 through 44 and 23 through 45. Now, friends, as you actually read these texts, 
start by noticing the context. Read the context around it. And as you're reading that, ask yourself questions like, what's going on here? Why is Jesus praying? When is he praying? What happens when he prays? Ask yourself those kind of questions and ponder those things. Let them sink in and have, just have fun with it. Invite Jesus to teach you how to pray as you read about his prayer life. Now, let's keep moving. All of us have experienced prayer at some level, right? All of us here have experienced prayer at some level. So we have some experience. What I want to do with the rest of this morning is I want us to give us some biblical principles to balance out our experience. And I want us to do that by inviting another one of Kipling's serving men to serve us, the serving man, how? How should we pray? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 9 through 11, what man among you, what man among you, when his son asked for a loaf, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would give him a steak? He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? How much more shall your heavenly Father give what is good to those who ask? Friends, the first thing that I see in these verses is that Jesus is teaching us to, is to pray honestly. To pray honestly. To pray openly and plainly. To tell God what our needs and desires are. Friends, hear this. God is a no-nonsense God. He doesn't want you and me beating around the bush or, or playing, and, you know what, I'm, I'm too embarrassed to ask God. He, wants, he says, you know what, if you need a fish, tell me you need a fish. If you need a loaf, Tell me you need a loaf. If you need justice like the woman in Luke 18, tell me you need justice. If you're hurting and angry, God says, I'm big enough to take that. Tell me you're hurting and angry. Catch this. Hear this, friends. Real prayer often begins with real needs. Real prayer often begins with real needs. And so Jesus is saying, take your needs and your desires, take your joys and your pain, and go to God honestly. And as you do, expect God to answer. Expect God to answer because God loves to give good gifts to those who ask him. In other words, Jesus is saying, when you go to your heavenly father with a request, you better have your arms open and ready to receive. You better have your arms open and ready to receive. Bishop Earl Hunt has a book. It's called A Bishop Speaks His Mind. And he shares this story in it. He says, many years ago, there was a woman in Chicago whose child was desperately and deeply ill. And she read in the newspaper that there was a great Australian pediatric surgeon that had come into town. His name was Dr. Adolph Lorenz. And so in desperate faith, she cried out in prayer that God would send this renowned specialist into her modest home to cure her child. Hear this. There was no influence to summons him. She had no money to pay him. Only she had her prayers. That's it. She had her prayers. Well, in the midst of a busy day, Dr. Lorenz went out to relax, and he wanted to see some of the remoter sections of the vast city by the lake, and he told his driver that as they came into this humble residential area, to let him out for about an hour stroll and then to pick him up at a specific designated place. In the midst of his walk, a sudden and violent thunderstorm hit Chicago. And Dr. Lorenz was seeking shelter in a simple little cottage that he was walking past. And guess what? Guess whose simple little cottage that house belonged to? That praying mother with her sick little child inside. But hear this. When he courteously gave his last name, Lorenz, and he asked if he could come inside for sanctuary from the rain. He was rudely and curtly refused admission. The next morning, the Chicago papers carried the famous doctor's indignant account of a poor housewife's inhospitality to a man from another land seeking shelter from a storm. And in that home, where it all happened, a shocked and incredulous woman, the very same woman who had prayed, but who really didn't believe that God would send Dr. Lorenz to her house, was now overwhelmed with sorrow and grief because she had missed the opportunity that God had provided for her. 
Friends, hear this. She prayed. She prayed. But she didn't have her arms open and ready to receive. Jesus says when we ask, ask honestly and expect to receive because God loves to give good gifts to those who ask. That leads us right into the second thing that I believe that Jesus is teaching us in these verses. And it's this. God loves to give good gifts. Good gifts to those that ask. Friends, Jesus even uses the word twice in these passages. He says that God gives good gifts and he gives what is good. He gives good gifts and he gives what is good. Hear this. It's important for you and I to understand this. Who defines what good is here as Jesus is using it? Who defines what good is as Jesus is using it? God does. God does. Friends, God looks at the big picture of time and eternity. And then he looks at the specific plans that he has for you and me. And he determines what's best for us as his children. Now, I don't know about you, but I did this all the time with my girls when they were growing up. All the time. Why? Because I loved them. I loved them. When my girls were little, we lived in Cincinnati, Ohio. And we lived in this nice little neighborhood on a relatively quiet street. But every once in a while... My girls, they must have got it from Deb, actually asked me if they could play in the street. And, and they would, seriously, they did. When they were little, they, they would sometimes ask me. They would say something like, please, 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 Daddy, there's no cars coming. Can't we just play in the street? And you know what? There was never a time that I said yes. There were a few times I wanted to. But there was never a time that I actually said yes to them. Why? Because I loved them too much. There was no way one of my little girls was going to play in that street. When Jessica, my favorite oldest daughter, was on the verge of learning how to drive, and she hadn't learned yet, you know what, I didn't turn to her and say, you know what, honey, I know that cars can be a metal bullet, but I want to make you happy. And even though you don't know how to drive that car, you can just take it out and take it for a spin anytime you want. Friends, there is absolutely no way. I love my daughters too much for that. Our Heavenly Father knows what's good for us. And he loves us too much to give us anything less than the best, even if we beg and cry for it. The third thing that I believe that Jesus is teaching us here, he wants us to be very, very clear on this, is that the one who gives us good gifts is our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Daddy. Friends, when Jesus talked and he prayed and he taught others about our Heavenly Father, he often used the Aramaic word, Abba. Abba, which means daddy. Abba was a word in that day that very few of the scholars and the rabbis actually used for God. But at the very same time, it was a very common word among the people. As a matter of fact, it would have been very common to walk down the streets of Jerusalem in that day and see a little boy or girl jump up into the arms of their daddy and cry out, Abba, Abba. It's a word that speaks of trust. It speaks of tenderness. It speaks of love and it speaks of protection. And when we think of God, Jesus says, I want you to think of trust, of tenderness, of love, and of protection. He says, I want you to think of Abba, your heavenly daddy. And so friends, when you and I pray, Jesus says pray honestly and pray expectantly because number one, you're praying to your heavenly daddy. And number two, because God loves to give good gifts to those who ask. He loves it. Friends, you know the number one reason the prayers aren't answered? The number one reason prayers aren't answered is because prayers are not prayed. The number one reason prayers aren't answered is because prayers are not prayed. James 4.2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. You do not ask. The principle here is actually very simple, friends. If you ask, you can receive. If you don't, you won't. There's a story told about a guy who dies and he goes to heaven. When he gets there, Jesus greets him and he invites him to go on a walk with him. As they're on this walk, they get to a place where there's nobody else around, but there is this huge stockpile of beautifully racked presents. As the man looks around and he realizes there's nobody else there, it's just him and Jesus and these beautifully wrapped presents. When he realizes this, he turns to Jesus and he's all excited. He says, Lord, are these all for me? Are these all for me? With that, 
Jesus has a tear rolling down his cheeks. He says, they were. But you never ask. You never ask. Friends, if you and I want our prayers to be answered, we've got to ask. Our Heavenly Father loves to give good gifts to those who ask, but we've got to ask. And when we ask, we need to ask specifically. Specifically. Philippians 4, 6 says, Let your requests be made known to God. Let your request be made known to God. In other words, let God know what you want and what you need specifically. Because friends, think about this. If you don't ask specifically, how are you ever going to know that God has actually answered your prayer? Think about that. When blind Barnabas cried out to Jesus on the dusty road to Jericho, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And if blind Bartimaeus would have thrown up some generalized God bless me prayer, today we could actually be reading in Scripture about how Jesus walked up to blind Bartimaeus, laid his hands on him, and said, bless you, son. Bless you, son. Or we could be reading about how Jesus gave him a cold cup of water or a bag of food. Now hear me, there's nothing wrong with those things, right? Those are good things. Those are blessings, right? They're all blessings, The problem is, blind Bartimaeus was blind. He needed to be healed. And he knew it. And hear this. And so when Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? Blind Bartimaeus didn't hesitate. He didn't hold back. He told Jesus just what he wanted. He said, Rabbi, teacher, I want to see. I want to see. And Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And Luke says immediately he regained his sight and he began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Friends, God wants us to pray specifically so that when he answers our request, he gets the glory and our faith grows. And so friends, when you pray, pray specifically, but also pray with right motives with right motives. The very next verse in James is James chapter 4, verse 3, and it says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives to spend it on your passions. In Mark chapter 10, James and John, two of Jesus' nearest and dearest, closest of friends and disciples, approach Jesus And they literally ask him if they can have the two seats of honor in his coming kingdom, one on his right-hand side and the other on his left-hand side. And do you remember what Jesus' response to them is? No. No. But catch this. Jesus doesn't say no because they aren't worthy to have those positions. Because think about this. The truth is they're as worthy as anybody. They are two of Jesus' closest and most faithful of followers. Absolutely. They have been with him from the very beginning. They have been with him through thick and thin. And so they are as worthy as any disciple to have those two positions. As worthy as any. And so Jesus doesn't say no because they're not worthy. No, he says no because of their motives and because of their passions. Friends, the truth is they wanted their names up in light. They wanted to have power. They wanted to have glory. They wanted to have positions for their own recognition. In other words, they weren't concerned about God's kingdom. They were concerned about theirs, and they were willing to leverage God, and they were willing to leverage prayer to get what they wanted. Friends, here's the thing. If you and I are honest with ourselves, many of our prayers are driven by the very same kind of motives and passions. That's the truth. Business people say, Lord, give me that new account. Pastors say, Lord, help our church grow. Christian musicians say, Lord, sell my albums. Athletes say, Lord, let me score the winning goal. Students say, Lord, give me good grades. Now, hear this. I want to stress this. There is nothing nothing inherently wrong with any one of those requests. They truly are excellent requests if they're asked with God's glory in mind. But that's the question, isn't it? Whose glory, when we go to him, are we actually asking for? His or ours? 
Friends, if you and I are going to call ourselves Christians, little Christ, that's what a Christian means. That's what it literally means, is a little Christ. Then we've got to have the same motives and the same passions that Jesus did. If we're going to be Christian, little Christ, and he did everything to the glory of his Father. So how do you and I pray? We pray by coming to our Heavenly Father who loves us, totally expecting Him to answer our requests with good gifts as we seek His glory. Now, we still have two of Kipling's serving men to serve us, and they're going to serve us very quickly here. They are the when and the where. First, where. Where should you and I pray? Where should we pray? Friends, we can pray anywhere. If you don't know this, literally, you can pray when you're driving. Don't text, but you can pray while you're driving. Don't close your eyes. But you can pray while you're driving. You can pray while you're walking. You can pray while you're sitting. You can pray anywhere. You, Jesus prayed on mountaintops. He prayed along the seashore. Think about this. He prayed in the desert. He prayed on dusty roads. He prayed in boats. He prayed in the gardens. He prayed in cities. He prayed on the cross. You and I can pray anywhere and everywhere because God is already there. We can go up to the highest mountain or down into the deepest valley, and God is already there. He's omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. And so anywhere and everywhere we are, we can pray. Finally, when should we pray? When should you and I pray? Anytime. Absolutely anytime. God's door is always open. He's open for business 24-7, 365, and catch this, appointments are not necessary. Luke 18, 1 says, pray at all times, at all times, and don't lose heart. Now, I want to close with this final thought, don't lose heart. Friends, if prayer doesn't seem to be working for you, I want to challenge you, don't give up, and don't go around declaring that prayer isn't real and that God really doesn't work through prayer. Because, friends, the truth is, there is, think about this, there is no more logic in saying that than saying that because your interconnect is, is down, interconnect is down, that there's no inter, internet. Does that mean that? If your internet is down, does it mean that there's no internet? Absolutely not. Friends, what do you do when your internet's down? You check your modem, right? And then you plug and, or unplug and then you replug your cord, right? That's what you do. And you know what I do if that doesn't work? I call in my son-in-laws. <laughs> That's exactly what I do. And I keep calling them until one of them figures out what's blocking my connection. Now, how do I know when the problem is fixed? When everything starts working. When everything starts working. The same thing is true with prayer. When our requests don't seem to be being answered, don't declare that prayer isn't real or that prayer doesn't work or that God doesn't answer prayer, but look for the disconnect. Look for the disconnect. Maybe you've been praying with the wrong motives. You can pray about a good thing with a wrong motive and God won't answer it. Maybe there's something in you that needs to be changed. Maybe it's more about you than the prayer request that you have. Maybe there's some sin in you that needs to be confessed. Maybe there's a new principle of prayer that God wants to teach you. Maybe you need some patience or perseverance. Or maybe it's simply, hear this, maybe it's simply not within God's good plan for you as he works that plan out in this world. If your prayers don't seem to be working, listen, make the necessary adjustments, and then try again. Friends, you and I can know that our prayers are being answered just as surely as we can know that our internet is working. Now, we're going to talk a whole lot more about this next week. I actually have decided, I, I really felt compelled to actually to, to add another message. We were going to go to mountain moving prayer next week, but I really felt like we could not go there until we talked about the mystery of unanswered prayer. Because if you begin, to, if you begin to, to pray more in these two weeks that we've been talking about this, I want you to understand the mystery of unanswered prayer. Because you may encounter it. You will encounter it on some level, I promise you. It's not as mysterious as we sometimes think it is, but there's still a mystery to unanswered prayer. And we're going to talk about that next week. But for now, remember this very simply. Jesus says point blank, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you.
Amen? Before I close, I want to speak to why here at Life Church we believe that God has called us to be a people of prayer. And I want to do it in this way. Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist of the 19th century, had a life statement. He had a life statement that highly has impacted me and motivated me in my Christian walk, and it's this. The world has not yet seen what God can do through one man who's wholly devoted to me. By his grace and for his glory, I intend to be that man. Friends, I don't know about you, but that statement moves me and it challenges me, and I want to become that man. But there's another statement that challenges me and moves me just as much, and it's this. The world has not yet seen what God can do through one church, one church that's wholly devoted to Him in prayer, and by His grace and for His glory. Hear this, I believe God wants Life Church to be that church. How about you? What do you believe that God is calling us as Life Church to do and to be? And hear this one, what are you willing to commit yourself to to see that happen? What are you willing to commit yourself to to see that happen? I want to challenge us, all of us, you, and I want to challenge me, to begin praying about how God wants us to engage in our praying the price fasting and prayer time that begins on September 24th. Our purpose during that prayer and fasting time is to seek the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives to fill us and to guide us and direct us and to empower us, the people of Life Church, to be Christ witnesses in word and deed everywhere we go in this world. And our aim in that is to reach our family, our friends, our neighbors, and the world with the life, love, and message of Jesus Christ. Friends, to do that, in order to do that, you and I have to fully surrender ourselves to God in and through this fasting and prayer time. The question is, will you? And the question is, will I do that? That's what you and I need to be praying about between now and September 24th. Now let's pray together. God, thank you for bringing us into your presence on this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for prayer. This opportunity to enter into heart-to-heart -heart communication with you. God, that's what friends do. That's what loved ones do. They enter into heart-to-heart -heart communication. Lord, I pray that for those of you, for those of us who don't know you yet as friend, that whatever relationship we think we have with you, that it would move to that place. For those of us who yet don't know you as our loved one, that our relationship with you would move to that place so that we would be embraced by the warmth of friendship and we would be secure in being one of your loved ones. God, I pray these things for, for all of us at Life Church and for all that seek you in this world. That we might be friends of God, loved ones of the Lord Most High. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.